Okay, let's hear it for Windows PowerShell. Yay! Okay, one more time. Let's try again. Windows PowerShell is the best. Yeah! Okay, all right. If you're like me, I don't go into Windows PowerShell hardly ever. Uh, I kind of avoid it. There's always other ways to do things than going to PowerShell. But actually, what I have discovered is that if you pick up a few tips and tricks, if you kind of ease yourself into it, don't jump in with the 500 character long commands that don't seem to make any sense. If you just ease yourself into it, actually PowerShell can actually be quite useful. Hello there, my name's Gary Sim. This is Gary Explains. Today, I want to give you five tips to help you learn Windows PowerShell. So if you want to find out more, please let me explain. Now the problem with Windows PowerShell is because it's kind of tied to the way Microsoft think in terms of .NET and objects, and which kind of, it can be pretty, uh, you know, kind of cumbersome. You know, some of the commands are so long, if you type in so much stuff, I'm going to die here typing in all this stuff. And really, you know, if you don't understand it, you know, it kind of, it's just like, no, leave me alone with that. And that's the, where I've been. But as I said in the introduction, you can actually learn some useful things about PowerShell. So in this video, what I'm going to do is going to go straight to the PowerShell. We're going to do an online hands-on tutorial. We're going to look at five things to help you learn PowerShell. And I hope you find it useful. Okay, let's get cracking. Okay, so here we are inside of PowerShell. It's a command line, so you type something, you press enter, and then uh, something happens that you want to happen. Now, the first thing we're going to do is make sure we're running the latest version of PowerShell. Now, there's a rather cryptic command, and this is, as I said, part of the problem with uh, PowerShell. Not everything is kind of uh, as dollar PS version table will tell us the version. As we can see, PowerShell PS, I'm using version 5.1. Now there is a newer version, so we're going to upgrade. Now the way you do that, if you're running Windows 10 or above, I hope, is you type winget search, and winget is a way of Windows get installing software on Windows from the command line. This is also the um, preferred way of installing PowerShell. So you do a winget search microsoft.powershell. And that will go and search the repositories that it has uh, set up and come back. And there we go. We can see there are two versions. One is the latest stable version and one is a preview version. So what we can do now is we can say winget install microsoft.powershell. And that will actually go ahead and install the new version for us. Okay, so I've restarted PowerShell, and in fact, we can see at the top there, PowerShell 7.2.6. Let's run our same command again, version table. By the way, if you hit tab, you do get completion. So I typed in there dollar PSV and then tab, and it came up. And there we go, now we're running version 7.2. Okay, so that's how you get the latest version. So let's talk a little bit about PowerShell. Now, if you are used at all to the old days of MS-DOS, and also uh, the command prompt used to get in Windows, Windows XP, Windows 95, 98, Windows XP, and, and so on, you can use all those commands, which means for someone like me who kind of came up uh, with DOS and then the command prompt in Windows, that's easy. I don't have to learn so many of these complicated commands. So, you know, you can do things like, you know, CD, uh, make directory. So let's, for example, let's do a make directory temp we can CD into temp change directory CD. Okay, we could, for example, uh, copy a file from somewhere. We can delete files. So for example, I've got a file in the directory above, dot dot for directory above. Uh, it's called 10 megabyte file, and I can copy it to here, and then we can do a DIR, and there you can see it. We could uh, rename it with ren, ren 10 megabyte file two to 10 megabyte file one. DIR, it's there. We can um, uh, delete it with Dell 10 megabyte file one. So those are the kind of commands you would be used to from within inside of the normal command prompt. And really your first introduction to PowerShell is to use those, to use the, uh, the commands that you're familiar with uh, that have been around in the Microsoft kind of ecosystem for, you know, for, for decades really. But of course that's just simple stuff like changing directory, renaming a file, copying a file, moving a file, deleting a file, 
there is of course much much more that can be done. Now one thing that's good from the command line is to be able to kill a process that's not responding. Of course you've got the task manager, but when I bring up my task manager, there's so many processes in there. Some of them are user processes, some are background processes, and it's really quite difficult to actually find the, the one that I want uh, to kill. So I actually find it often useful to do it from the command line. Now the way you do that, and now we're going to actually use our first time, we're going to use a much more kind of PowerShell kind of uh, thing, uh, command get minus hyphen process and that will list all the processes that are running on your Windows machine and there you go there they are all listed now I've actually got a copy of uh, notepad running look here it is so here's a copy of notepad and what we're going to do is we're going to try and find that copy of notepad so what you can actually do is you can do get process and then notepad and now we can see here that that is the notepad process and it's running and how you know it's CPU usage and memory usage and all that kind of stuff. We won't go into that now. But if I wanted to kill it, I could actually uh, get rid of it. So let's see whether so it's still here, it's still alive. I think if I click on the terminal, it's going to disappear behind it. So I can't show you it being killed. But what we can do is you can do get process and then we say notepad. And this is interesting. Once this gets this, you can then pipe this. This is different to the pipes that you get in uh, Linux or Unix. This is actually passing an object. And the whole thing about PowerShell is, is it reflects different objects that are created. This, that's for a more advanced tutorial. But if we pass it into stop process, then it will find this process and then pass that object through to the stop process command and it will kill it. So if we now do that, and I can tell you that the, it's gone. And in fact, if we now do get process again, we can see there is no process with the name Notepad because it actually got rid of it. Let me uh, start it up again. So here it is actually up and running again. Now, what get hyphen process, pass it into stop process. This is where I personally struggle with PowerShell too much, too long. I'll spend all my high life, whole life typing in these things. Luckily, there are things called aliases. Now, you can actually, there's an alias for get process, which is the same as the command that you'd have on, on Linux. So if, or Unix, if you just type PS, now you can get a list of all the processes. So if you kind of know a bit of Linux, then you can also actually get by a bit on PowerShell. And we can do the same thing. We can do PS notepad and that will find the notepad. And then we can do the same thing. We can do PS notepad and now pipe it into pass it through to kill, which is an alias for stop hyphen process. And, and it's gone again. I, off screen there it went. If we do a PS now for notepad, it, it's actually gone. Now, how do we get a list of these aliases? Well, there's actually a command called get, uh, get alias, and that will list it all out here. So if we just scroll up here a little bit, there we go, PS that we typed in is the same as uh, get process. So that's uh, pretty handy. Kill here is the same as stop process. And actually, you'll find that a lot of things, man, uh, that you find on, you know, on Linux is, is help ls is the same as get children uh, item, which actually is how you do a directory listing and so on. So there's actually you can study these and you'll actually may find that there's a lot of commands here that you might be used to or familiar with. And you can say, oh, that's good. I can just use uh, the alias. Now, if you're looking for a particular alias, for example, we wanted to find out what the aliases were for for stop process. What you can do is you can say. Uh, get uh, alias and then you can pipe it into and you do a find str find string minus i because we don't uh, care about the uh, the case so case incentive and let's do process and there you can see get process and stop process have got several different uh, uh, aliases and you can use them however you feel uh, what you're most comfortable with. So they've not only included kind of the Linux ones, there's also kind of, you know, short term version. GPS is get process. So they've got their own kind of short term shortcut versions as well, which you can use. Now I've been typing lots and lots of things here. Now, the interestingly, there's actually a history where you can see all the different things that we've been typing. There you go. There's all those commands you've seen me being uh, typing while we're here. Now you can actually get that with an alias, just H. And that will list. So if you wanted to repeat a particular command, what you can do is you can invoke history. <laughs> I H Y is its alias. I'm not typing all that lot in. So if we did 
uh, number 15, for example, what's number 15? It's this one here, look. It will do a PS. So if we do IHY15, it repeats and does a PS. That's really handy if you've been typing in very long commands uh, and you want to, uh, you know, find, go back and, and find them without having to type them in again. Now, there's another one, for example, if we wanted to uh, redo uh, get alias, what we can actually do is an, uh, invoke history, and you can actually just do get a like that, and it will actually show us, well, in fact, it did the last one, which was get alias with the fine string for process. So it doesn't only, have, you don't only have to provide this number here, you can also provide the first few letters of the command and it will find the newest one uh, and execute that. So that's what that's why we did the get a there and it found get alias. Of course, be careful with this because obviously you could suddenly invoke a command that you uh, that you had like typed in ages ago and it's still in your history and it, you know, it reformats your disk or something. I mean, I'm, I know that's an exaggeration, but I'm saying be careful when you're calling up history. That's equally true on Linux. Very, very powerful way of doing a quick shortcut, but make sure you don't invoke the wrong command uh, by mistake. Okay, let's talk about how you can put content into files. This is very useful if you want to have a quick way of just putting in some fixed content, uh, particularly for testing things. So we're gonna create a new uh, file, a new item, that's what it is in PowerShell NI, and we're gonna create a file called test.csv, a comma separated file, and there we go, it's created, and it's noticed their length is zero because it's now empty, so it's just created an empty file for you. Now we have to go use a long con a long command now, uh, set content, so set the content of what? Of test.csv, well to what? Well let's put some comma separated values in here, let's put in some prime numbers, there we go. And to make sure there's no carriage return line feed on the end, I'm gonna put dash no new line at the end. So there you go, if we now do a DIR, we can see there is now a file, and then it's actually got something in it, 12 characters, and we can use cat, uh, you know, like you would on Linux, it's an alias again for showing us the contents of test.csv, you go, 13511. Uh, now you can actually uh, add to the contents of that file, there's actually an, an add uh, content command, it's also got an alias, ac, so let's say ac test.csv, and we're gonna put in comma, because there wasn't a comma at the end there, so we're gonna carry on 13, 17, 19, and uh, 23, and again, uh, no uh, new line. And now if we go and do a cat of test here, so there you can see we've now created uh, even more content all on that one line. Now thankfully you don't always have to use, uh, you know, add content, set content, you can actually do redirection like you can do on uh, like you can do on Linux. If we do a DIR, well, let's do a DIR and pipe that to dir.txt. And actually what you'll find is now there is a file called dir.txt. And if we have a look at dir.txt, it's exactly the output that we had from the DIR command. Now that redirection, there's actually several levels of redirection. You can redirect everything, redirect errors only, not include errors. We won't go into that now. You can look that up if that's the kind of thing you're interested in. But just like uh, Linux, what's interesting though, is I can now do DIR. And if I use double uh, chevrons, double greater than signs, and then again, dir.txt, it will append to it. So now if we look at that, that file is even bigger, 544 bytes up from 272 bytes. And now if we look inside of it, we can see that is in fact a copy of two DIR instructions. So again, you don't you, you can use these alias and things, really a good way to get into PowerShell if you're familiar with doing uh, other things. Okay, and the fifth and final thing is how we use, and this is really powerful, secure shell. There wasn't always uh, SSH secure shell available on Windows, but it is here. So if I wanted to secure shell into a Raspberry Pi, and let's say I've got one at 192.168.1.44, uh, I actually happen to know with 4.4, it's my four gigabyte version of my Raspberry Pi 4. So 4.4, easy for me to remember. And here is a command line version of Secure Shell, something of course you're familiar with with Linux, but it's great having it here on Windows. I'll just type in the password. And that's it, I'm now connected to that Raspberry Pi 4. I can run normal Linux commands here, htop, showing me what's going on on that Raspberry Pi. Everything looks great on there. Now, what was interesting, of course, is that I had to uh, type in my password. Now, there is a command on Linux, 
an on unit called SSH Copy ID, and this is a way of copying over the, the uh, keys onto the other machine so you can type log in without needing to specify your password. The, the keys are checked to make sure everything is okay. Now, there, that, this command doesn't exist. If I hit that, it doesn't exist. It's not recognized. They don't have that. But there is a way of doing it so that you can actually achieve the same thing. Now, it's a bit of a long command, but it's worth actually uh, noting it. So, what do we do? Type, that's the same as cat. That means display the contents of .sh ID RSA pub, that's your public key that you want copied over to the remote machine. Pipe that into secure shell and there's my connection through to my Raspberry Pi 4. And then once you get there, execute this command, cat double chevrons means append it to the file authorized key. So it'll basically take this public key and add it to the list of authorized keys. Now the first time you do it, of course, I need to type in the password again because it's never been done before. And that's it, it's done it. So now if I go back and actually do a secure shell, I won't need to type in password. There we go. I'm in straight away. You should be doing this with all of your uh, Raspberry Pis and whatever you've got on your, your Jetson Nanos, whatever you've got on your local network. But it's also great to do it here from within inside the PowerShell. And another thing we can do, what have I got here? I've got this file, right? dir.txt is I can do SCP, that's secure shell copy. So copy over the network using secure shell. And we're going to, well, let's use uh, dir. Dot txt and I want to copy that to pi at 192.168.1.44 and where do I want to put it? Well, I'm just going to put it straight there in the user directory. So dot, of course, means in that current directory and that will now copy that file all the way over to my Raspberry Pi. So if I now connect into my Raspberry Pi again, no password needed, I can now do a cat of dir.txt and there it is, that file that we created with the list of directories. So now from the PowerShell command line, you can access your Linux machines, you can access anything that's got secure shell, you can connect over the internet to maybe you've got some web hosting, some web servers, you've got some servers in the cloud, Docker, whatever it is you're doing, you can now connect here from the thing and of course you get from PowerShell and you can copy files around using secure uh, copy. So that's absolutely brilliant. So if you kind of take those five things, that's really your favorite DOS commands that you're already used to, process management, killing files, using the history, being able to add things to files, create files, uh, pipe the content of the output of one command into another file, and also then using secure shell and secure copy. If you can get the master of those things, I think that you're on a good foot stepping to understanding and even growing to like, maybe, even growing to like uh, Windows PowerShell. Okay, so there it is, five ways to help you learn PowerShell. I really hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please do give it a thumbs up. If you like these kind of videos, well, tell me in the description below what kind of videos like this you'd like to see more of. That would be great. And also do subscribe to the channel. Don't forget, you can follow me on Twitter, at Gary Explains. And I also have a monthly newsletter. Go over to GaryExplains.com, type in your email address, no spam, but you will get the newsletter. Okay, that's it. I'll see you in the next one. Mm -hmm.